Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of the Dutch Independent City of Vlaambeer. Um, can I just really quickly ask who here knows Vlaambeer? Just raise your hand. Okay, I'll do a quick introduction for everybody else. Um, so my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Vlaambeer, as I said, uh, at Vlaambeer. I'm responsible for the uh, business, uh, the marketing and programming. Um, my colleague is JW, who is our uh, designer. And um, we were founded in 2010. We've made quite a few games since then. We are best known for our games uh, Super Crate Box, uh, Ridiculous Fishing, Luftrausers, Gun Gods, uh, Serious Sam, The Random Encounter, and uh, most recently Nuclear Throne. We started back in 2010. We were both university dropouts. We'd been making games for most of our life, um, but the university we were at um, didn't really work for us. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, suggest people should quit school because that's a horrible idea. Uh, I just wanted to like explain what our story is. Um, me and JW, me and my co-founder, we didn't really like each other. Uh, he's very much an artistic person. I'm very much a, a logical person, a, a programmer. Uh, I like to make commercial games. He liked to make just 300 games a year. Um, so we didn't really like each other. I thought he was kind of an obnoxious hipster, and he kind of thought I was like a suit. Um, so we didn't really get along. Um, but the one thing we hated more than we hated each other uh, ended up being our school. So uh, both of us dropped out, and uh, that was an immediate success. Uh, these were the ramen noodles we ate for a year and a half, something like that. Uh, it was good because they were uh, really, really cheap. I don't even know where... You, oh, there's the screen. Uh, they're really, really cheap. It was like three for one euro, which means we could afford them being university dropouts. Uh, we made a lot of money, or enough to buy me caffeine so I could program. Uh, but that was about all we had. Uh, and since we didn't really have money, we needed to figure out how we could make money, and all we were good at was making games. So we decided to make a game about fishing with machine guns. Um, the game was called Radical Fishing. So Radical Fishing was the first game. This was back when Flash sponsorships were still a thing. And um, in fact, uh, for two student dropouts, this game made $10,000, uh, which uh, actually $10,001, but that's a very long story. Um, the game made $10,001, and that was enough for us to make new stuff. Um, so we took this very early prototype that JW made called Crates from Hell, and uh, we spend pretty much most of those $10,000 into turning it into Super Crate Box. And uh, Super Crate Box might have been our first hit. Um, it was a freeware game, so we made absolutely zero money, so that didn't help. Um, but it was nominated for pretty much every Independent Games Award you could think of, uh, most notably the Independent Games Festival Award, which is um, the Oscars of Independent Games Awards. So. Uh, that was exciting, from going from eating ramen noodles to flying to San Francisco for like fancy award ceremonies. Um, it was quite a switch. So um, suddenly people were interested in what we were doing. So we stayed really humble, and then we started making more games. Uh, this was uh, Gun Gods, which was a first-person shooter about hip-hop on the planet Venus. Uh, and then people started asking us to give talks, which we didn't really know what we were doing, but I guess... Um, then we started making more games. This game was uh, Serious Sam The Random Encounter. It was a turn-based RPG about the Serious Sam series. And Serious Sam is a pretty big established AAA IP. Um, so having the opportunity to work in the IP was really cool. And it also gave us a lot of uh, legitimacy. Like a lot of larger companies started thinking of us as a more real game studio at that point. We started going to conferences, printed our own t-shirts, and then we started working on Ridiculous Fishing, which was our uh, breakout game. If you, if you remember that Flash game we made, you know, the game about fishing with machine guns that earned us those $10,001, uh, we decided that that would be a really good mobile game. So we started working on a mobile version of that. We found a programmer from New York, Zach Gage, and an artist from Chicago, Greg Woolwind, and our musician from Norway, Eirik Surke. And um, we got this team together and we worked on the game and for six months everything was going super well. Like things were moving fast, we were excited, we were motivated, and the game was just, it was moving so rapidly. And this was back in 2000 and I think 12. Uh, and then we kind of got screwed over. Uh, there was a studio in San Francisco that thought, hey, that radical fishing game, that fishing game about fishing with machine guns, that's really cool. We're going to make that and put it on iOS. 
Uh, so they beat us to market. Uh, while we were working on our version of the iOS game, uh, they cloned our game and released it on iOS. Um, they set out a good 87 Metacritic, and uh, above that, they made a really quickly made a million dollars. Uh, so for a small studio that has no way to do anything about that, because you know, video game clones are not really something you can defend yourself against, um, that hurt. Uh, it hurt enough that we almost quit making games, uh, but luckily we were really stubborn, so we went to the New York Times to kind of complain about it. You can tell that I don't like my colleague because I put the text over his face. It's subtle, but I really like it. Makes me happy. Um, Anyway, so we went to the New York Times and we talked about the whole, th uh, the whole thing and they wrote this amazing article and then suddenly everybody thought we were like legit, legit, right? Like you can make a game that does well and wins an independent game festival award and you can make a game in a AAA series but if you have been on one of the main pages of the New York Times then people take you very seriously all of a sudden. So um, we did that, we got a lot more involved in the games industry, started organizing meetups and started helping out organizing events. Uh, started organizing game jams, stuff like that, and then um, we uh, made more games. This was Lufthrausers, uh, and Lufthrausers was a very angry dogfighting game. We were very angry that we got cloned, so we made a really angry game. Um, and then we got even more involved in stuff, like we started making tools, we started helping out at award ceremonies, stuff like that. Um, and eventually we released Ridiculous Fishing. Uh, Ridiculous Fishing came out back in 2013. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I have a very quick video. I don't really have the audio, but that's fine. Forgot the audio. You know what? This is what it looks like. I, I'm not going to sing the music for you. So Ridiculous Fishing came out in 2013, and it was a very simple game about dodging fish and then catching fish. And you play it with your iPhone or iPad by like tilting it sideways. And then you shoot them with machine guns. Or rocket launchers. Um, so yeah, Ridiculous Fishing came out and uh, it actually won uh, the iOS Game of the Year Award for 2013. We were recently uh, crowned best iOS game, uh, actually, that's not true, we were recently crowned second best iOS game ever uh, by Pocket Gamer, which was um, really cool. Uh, the game did really well, it did financially well, it, it helped us start on our next project, Nuclear Throne, which has been in the, was in development for two and a half years and recently released on PC and Mac and Linux, and PlayStation 4, and PlayStation Vita, and it's probably coming to a bunch more stuff. Um, so that's the intro, that's who I am, uh, that's what I do. Um, one of the things I also do a lot is I do a lot of uh, speaking, and uh, the organizers came to me to um, ask me if I could fill this slot because it became available. So I basically asked a whole bunch of developers around here just some questions about what um, they thought I should mention in my talk. So here is a bunch of things I thought I should mention, and that is the actual official real name of my talk. Um, and this talk is going to be mostly focused on game developers and creators. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of business, there's going to be a bunch of marketing, there's going to be a bunch of design. Um, so if you're an independent game developer, this might be useful. Uh, if not, who knows? Creativity is often... Um, especially in the games industry, we very often talk about it as this sort of magical force that um, comes out of nowhere and inspires us and helps us make these games. But the honest thing, the honest reality is that creativity is a very practical thing. Uh, it's one of the few things in the world that is very hard to practice or learn or um, get better at through anything but doing it. And if you're going to do something you're not good at, you're going to fail a whole lot. Um, I think, in fact, that the most important thing you can do to be a creative is to fail as often as you can and as hard as you can. Um, and if you can do that in a safe environment, then that is probably the best way. But the honest reality is that the majority of the people in this room are probably going to fail at some point in quite a bad way. Uh, and that's just the way game development is. Uh, I don't want to make you like depressed or something, but 
let's be honest, like things go wrong. Um, and for very many people, things going wrong, going out of business, going bankrupt, a game not selling well, your first game not selling well, is, is something that they're scared of. And I would like to reassure you that that is absolutely not something you need to be scared of. Uh, for, for in most cases, when you hear about a success story, you only hear the parts that are good. So before Flamber started, I actually had another company that failed. Uh, I made games since I was six, and I was pretty sure every single one of those games was the best game ever. Uh, I didn't make a game that was respected until I was 21, so that's 15 years of complete failure. Um, but the way we got better at making games, the way I got better at making games was through my colleague, who, like I mentioned, I might not like a lot, but he made 300 games a year. And that's not even kidding. He would come back, he would come back home from school at 3 p.m., and uh, he would sit down and he would say, I'm going to make a game about a dog. And it would be done by 6 p.m. So he would make it in three hours. Just sit down and make the game. And to be honest, most of those games were really bad. They were awfully bad. Like most of them were awful. Not even fun, not even interesting. Just bad. But because he made 300 a year, there were a few that were good. But more importantly, he learned 298 things that he should not do. And I didn't, right? I made commercial games. I made one game every two years, and they were like quality games, and they were commercial, and they sold. But when it comes to design, he's obviously the better designer. He's so much better than I am, just because he has made games that are like these tiny little experiments. Like, is it better if the car moves like 10% faster or 10% slower? And he made both of those games, so he actually knows, because he tried. And I don't. I just picked a number, and then tweaked it. Um, so another thing about creativity is that creativity is a very personal thing. And that is also quite a, quite a strange lesson. Most developers, especially when they're starting out, especially when you're starting a company, you try to make something that is very much like other things you've seen. That's a very natural uh, way to look. You, you try and find a game that you like, and then you try to make a better version of it. Um, the thing about creativity is creativity seems to work best if it's just very you. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but um, if you're going to be making things, please don't try to make things because they are successful. If you're trying to make a game because it is popular now, like if you've been playing mobile games, you've probably played Clash Royale. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people starting prototypes that are like Clash Royale. So here's the thing, whenever something is successful, or whenever something is set on a stage, anything you hear today at this event, anything you hear at any time at any event, anything you read in the press is outdated. It always is. Because by the time somebody has thought things through far enough that they can get on a stage and tell you about it, they've, they've tried it, they had the idea, they executed it, then after they executed on the, idea, on the idea, they had time to look back at what happened, evaluate it, compare it, see how it worked, write a talk, find a conference, and then tell you. So all of the things are at least a year, maybe a year and a half outdated. That's not really a problem, but when you decide to make a game because it looks like something that is popular, you're a year and a half late, probably three and a half years late because it also took two and a half years to make the game. So just try to make your own thing. Try to make the things that you are excited about and the things that you want to make rather than the things you think will work because you looked at the market and this is hot right now. And the most important thing is just try not to waste people's time. If there is any golden rule in game design, any, any golden rule in creativity, it is respect people's time. Don't make something because, you know, I just want to keep people busy or I just want to keep people uh, engaged through like retention mechanics that are basically just a waste of time. Um, try to make things that feel valuable, that feel like a valuable addition to people's life. And the honest truth for that is that it's different per game and that not all games are for everybody and some people will always feel like you wasted their time and it's the internet so a lot of people will tell you that you made the worst game ever and you should be ashamed of yourself uh, because that's what the internet does. Um, but if you genuinely try to make something that enriches people's life, 
that makes their life just a little bit more joyful or a little bit more fun or teaches them something, that game will be worth way more than any other game you could make. And a lot of people are very cynical of a lot of the bigger games, right? Like a lot of people are very cynical of the AAA games because, you know, they're just entertainment. And a lot of people are very cynical of the big mobile games like Clash Royale where they're like, oh, they're just cra cash grabs. But the honest truth is all of those games add value to people's life. Clash Royale, I've been playing that for months at this point. And I love it. I think it's a brilliant game. So if you make sure to make games that, are, that value your player's time, you'll make, you'll make better games. So um, let's talk about process real quick. Um, I said fail fast and often. One of the best ways to fail, you know what the best way is to fail really fast? Start on something and then kill it if it's bad. There's an old, there's an old saying, uh, kill your darlings. Um, if you really like something, but there's no way to evaluate whether it's good, just kill it immediately. There's gonna be something that you like, that you love making, that is also good that is also appropriate for right now. And you can always come back to a project later. Um, and there's this vague myth that more time means that something is more useful, that more time spent on developing a game is gonna make the game better, and the honest truth is it will not. Uh, some of the best games that have come out in the last few years came out of Game Jam, 48 hour contests of game creation. And it's just 48 hours. And people made some of the biggest indie hits in the last few years based on those Game Jams. If you've played Super Hot, which was a game that came out just the other day, that original game was made in seven days, and then they polished the rest of it. Um, the basic idea, the way, the way I like thinking about it, is uh, a game designer by the name of Jesse came up with the concept of the loop. And the loop is just one full iteration of a development process. So it is ideate, come up with an idea, implement it, and after you've implemented the idea, uh, evaluate whether it works, and then after you evaluate it, keep it or drop it, right? And he says that the way to make the best game possible is to go through the loop as often as possible in the time you have. That's all you need to do, is come up with an idea, make it, test it, throw it away if it's bad, keep it if it's good. And if you do that as often as possible, you're gonna make the best game possible. Um, sometimes a loop can just be hours. You can have an idea, test, build it, and test it in hours. And if you, can do, if you can test faster, that's actually a better loop than if you take months creating something and then testing it. Um, so, the idea that more time makes better games is nonsense. Sometimes having less time will make for a better game. Sometimes putting more pressure on yourself to make something fast and try it and fail fast again uh, will make a better game. Now the final, the final process thought that we've got uh, at Flambeer is any project we make, uh, we have found that if you spend 20% of your time coming up with the actual game mechanics, co the core game, and spend the other 80% of the time polishing the game and making sure it communicates well, the UI works well, that everything feels good, flows well, that everything has impact or a sense of uh, movement, that everybody is f like goes through the right points at the right time, um, that if you do 20% of pure mechanical uh, work or in case of free-to-play games monetization work and 80% time polishing things, that you're probably still polishing a little too little. But if the majority of your time is spent creating the game, you've got a problem. Because the majority of your time should be spent polishing, always. Because polish is really, really hard. Um, so the way we work nowadays is if we have a prototype that takes us about two days to create, just two days, we spend about a year and a half polishing it before commercial release. So that's from two days to a year and a half. So 20, 2080? That's, that's how I like calling the rule, but the honest truth is that's probably going to be way more. Um, and polish is extremely important. You can make an amazing game that is unpolished and it will be bad. And you can take a really bad game and polish it really well and it will look good. So if you're going to be making a good game, please do your game the favor of polishing it well. Please spend that time on it. Now everybody always says everybody, everything is a remix and everything is a remix, but what everything is a remix, we don't mean mix two different things together to make a new thing. We mean that creativity is a remix of everything. So it's a remix of everything you know. It's a remix of the movies you've watched, the music you've listened to, the talks you've listened to, uh, the color of shirts you prefer, um, whether you went skydiving in your life or not. Um, 
your creativity is only limited by all the experiences you have. So the more experiences you have, the better it is. The more games you play, if you're not downloading, if you're making mobile games and you are not downloading the featured game every week, then you are not being the best game developer you can be. If you are trying to create games in a specific genre and you're not playing everything related to that, you could be better at what you do. But if you're trying to make action games, right, you're trying to make shooting games, what you should also be doing is watching action movies. What you should also be doing is watching documentaries. What you should also be doing is reading books. Not, it's not just, just look at video games, it's look at everything. Get more everything. And if you get more everything, you'll be able to remix better. A lot of people I meet are not trying to make a game. They're trying to make a thing that just happens to be a game. Please make a game. I'm going to not talk too much about this slide, but games are different from books, okay? And they're different from movies, and there's many reasons why they are different, but if the thing you're making is not only possible as a game, if it can't exist in any other form, please don't make that game. Make a game. Something that is a game that could only exist as a game. Because that's when you make interesting stuff. And then, try and understand what you're making. If, you are going, if you're going to make a game that is a horror game, please don't promote it with a very cute video, right? Like, if you're trying to make a game that is aggressive, make the game feel aggressive. If you're trying to make a game that teaches people something, make sure it actually teaches them. Very often, I come across people that say, like, oh yeah, I'm trying to make an educational game about... Um, the immune system. And I ask them, what is it? And they say, well, it's a first-person shooter. And like, that's, you, the theme is immunization, but the game is a shooting game where you shoot at things. And they're like, yeah, but you know, people will learn through the theme. That's not true, right? So understand what you're making and then make that. Don't make something else. Like the, the, the disconnect that a lot of creators have from their own game is one of the main reasons a lot of games fail. Because people just do not understand what they're making. And then again, uh, try, to do, try to keep things very small. The core of your game should be something you can explain in one sentence. I call it an essence statement. If you can explain it in your team, between the people working on the game, what your game is supposed to achieve in one sentence, you're going to be making a good game. In the case of Ridiculous Fishing, our, our essence statement had nothing to do with fish or shooting. The idea was to make an infinitely positive feedback loop that whatever you play, you always feel like you're making progress. And that was the essence statement, an infinitely positive feedback loop. If you can make things small, if you can cut things, if you do, like if there's a button in your game that you don't need, get rid of the button. Like a lot of games do shooting buttons where you have to hold a button to shoot, but you should always be shooting. Why is there a shooting button? Remove the shoot button. Just let the thing shoot it on its own. So for programming, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to do this really fast. Uh, if you can't code, learn to prototype. If you can code, learn to prototype. Um, if you can't code, just learn Game Maker or something. Like pick a very easy programming language and figure out how to use that. It's going to be really useful in communicating uh, ideas and designs you have. If you are a coder, learn to prototype. Because you probably are horrible at prototyping. If you are a programmer, you're really good at writing really nice code and like making sure that everything is structured well and that everything works well and that there's no bugs and you're going to take months making a very simple idea. Learn to be rather sloppy with prototyping. Just make the thing really fast. Use whatever works. There's no right or wrong programming language. There's no uh, wrong way of structuring a prototype. Just make it work. Just set aside that pride of your pretty code and prototype already. Uh, and then optimize later. Optimization is very important, but if you don't know whether your game works, you can program for months and it will still not be a good game. Uh, it'll just be a very well-coded game. Now let's go through art real quick. Art isn't necessarily about being pretty. Uh, it being pretty is just a hopeful benefit of making proper art, but art is about communicating what is happening in the game. If your art is not communicating what is happening in the game, is not part of how the game should feel, you should get rid of it or do something else with it. Um, but the important thing is that art is always functional and communicating. If it is important to the game, it should ha be very clear that it is interactive, that you can interact with it. Uh, a lot of our enemies in our games, our games are really fast. All the enemies have thick black outlines. Nothing else does. If art is not communicating, it's not good art. And if you're not an artist, um, learn to draw a little bit. I'm really bad at drawing. If I have to draw a cow, I draw a circle with four 
like lines under it and I put an arrow above it with the word cow. Um, but it helps because now I can explain to my team that we're talking about a cow. Um, so make sure you learn to draw a little bit. And um, then obsess about art history. Uh, this is a weird thing, but uh, the games industry, the saddest thing about the games industry is that we've been around for 60 years and there is not a single book that will tell us the history of video games. There just isn't. The, all the lessons that this medium has learned in the past 60 years are gone. The old talks at GDC, if you want to watch a GDC talk from before like 2000 or something, they're just gone. The things people talked about, they're gone. Everything that was made a long time ago, those devices don't work anymore. We've lost a lot of history. If you work in a field where there is history, please obsess about that history. I'm going to have to go really fast because I just got the one minute sign. Uh, same thing goes about audio. Uh, make sure you communicate properly. One of the funniest stories I've ever heard was a designer that worked on a big first person shooter and everybody thought the shotgun was underpowered. And the shotgun wasn't underpowered, nobody wanted to use it. And the only reason people didn't want to use it was because the sound effect wasn't good. It sounded like pfft. And everybody thought that was a bad shotgun, that it wasn't strong, that it wasn't doing damage, but it was doing damage. People just didn't feel that way. So all the designer did was go back and put a lot of bass on that sound effect. So it sounded like pfft. And everybody thought it was strong. It didn't change the single value, only changed the sound. So make sure your sound is good and that it communicates. Audio of all the senses we have is the most direct one. Um, so sound goes straight through your heart. It's a big part of communicating an atmosphere. You can do very subtle things through audio that you could do in no other way. Um, and it's by far the thing that has the largest impact on atmosphere. If you don't have a musician in the first week of your new project, get a musician. Please get a musician. Your game will be so much better if you bring somebody for audio on very early. Um, and you sound sparingly. Uh, our audio senses, again, are the ones that are close to our heart. That also means that they're the easiest for us to figure out when they're repetitive or when they sound wrong or whether they don't sound appropriate. Um, so you sound sparingly and use it smartly. If you're going to be making a game, if you have a story, please don't tell the story. Let people interact with the story and then you can tell the story besides that. But make sure that your story fits what the player is doing. Um, a good story will only help a good game. If your game idea is a story, stop right there. Don't do that. Your game has to be a game. And then if you figured out the game that you can use to tell the story, then we can talk about the story. But don't start with the story. Start with how will the player interact with the story. Um, and then realism is very relative. Uh, we made a game about fishing with machine guns, and that makes total sense in that universe. You don't have to make a realistic game. You can make a realistic game, but the only thing that's important about a game world is that it's consistent with itself. If you want to pitch your game, do it in two or three sentences. You have two or three sentences, that's exactly it. You want to explain what your game is, why it's important, and why people should care. If you're not explaining those three things in three sentences, it's not a good pitch. Uh, Know your place. Your place in the industry is you are trying to keep your fans happy. If your fans are not happy, things are not going to go well. Uh, and if you're not negotiating, you need to be negotiating. Um, the base contract you get from any company is always against you. If somebody sends you a contract, that's the best contract for them. So you can negotiate. Never be afraid to negotiate. The first time I did a negotiation, I negotiated really poorly. I asked for $30,000 for something. And then they said the first thing, so you know what the worst negotiation is? You say, I want 30 grand. And they say, yes. That is the worst negotiation because you could have probably asked double and they would still have been happy. Um, in fact, they would have been happy with three times that. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing marketing, show some empathy, like make sure you understand your fans. Fans are not game designers. Don't tell them the technological story. Tell them the story they understand. Um, that doesn't mean you have to belittle them. It just has, you need to emphasize why things are the way they are. Um, identify what is different about your game, what is unique about your game. Uh, every game has something that's a selling point. If it does not have a selling point, just don't make that game. And make large lists about um, marketing, Twitch streamers, uh, platforms, people you know. Uh, I have some team thoughts. Can I get Yeah. Okay. Uh, make sure everybody in your team has a clear responsibility so you can point out who, what went wrong and who did it wrong. If there are extra people on your team that you don't really need, please get rid of them. This sounds really mean, but if you are eight people and you have to pay eight salaries and you're earning money for four, either everybody is going to be out of a job or some of you are going to be out of a job. So, and uh, if you are on a team and they need to get rid of people, don't be that extra weight. Um, make sure you're useful. Um, don't be afraid of failing. You can't really fail in the games industry. You can just you know, be in a bad spot where you can't really try again immediately. Don't search for perfection. At some point, you have to ship the game. Ship the game. 
Have somebody on your team that is only responsible for shipping the game. Make sure you ship and manage your team well. Uh, if you have more than four or five people, you need to make sure there's somebody in charge of making sure everything is communicated well. Let's talk even faster. Uh, always be curious about everything. I said everything is a remix, so try and make sure you know everything. Learn about nature, plants, animals, bodies, philosophy, religion, bo movies, books, culture. Go skydive. Please go skydive. If you've never gone skydiving, go skydive. Uh, I am not sponsored by any skydiving company, but just do it. Um, never assume things about anything. There's a lot of assumptions you can make. You are wrong. If you think you know how the games industry works and you don't know it from personal experience, let me reassure you, that is not how it works. You know how you figure out how it works? You go talk to somebody who does know. The fun, the fun thing about the games industry is we all like each other in general. So you can just go to somebody who has done something and ask them, how did that go? What did you learn? Who should I talk to? Don't be afraid to ask. And then whenever that happens, whenever somebody comes to you, participate in that. If somebody has a question, please just answer their question. It's that easy. You can make the industry a better place for everybody. Um, if you're not on Twitter, be on Twitter. If you don't want to be on Twitter, that is fine as well. Actually, honestly, like, you know, the industry changes really rapidly. I really like Twitter. Uh, if you are on Twitter, don't forget to follow me. Um, make sure you've got a portfolio. A portfolio doesn't need to be like, you know, like the fancy portfolio. Just make sure you have something to, that you can talk about. Even if it's a very early prototype, it doesn't matter. Have something to show. And then make sure you can get found, uh, people can find you. If your name is very difficult, have a nickname. One of my best friends is Mikolaj Kominski from Poland. Nobody knows how to write that name. Uh, so he just calls himself SOS, S-O-S, and now people can find him. Uh, if you haven't read this book, re read this book. If you haven't read this book, read this book. If you haven't read this book, read this book. If you haven't played these games, play these games. If you haven't played these games, play these games. And if you haven't played these games, play these games. If you're at a convention, so you already did this right, you're here, so you're doing the thing you're passionate about, so go make lots of games. Thank you.